What's up YouTube and welcome to the channel. My name is Kyle and typically you're gonna find me out on a job site building a post frame structure. But for today's video, we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna talk about the process that leads up to the point of building and the things that you want to consider. In fact, I've got, I've got 10 different things that I want you to think about when building your post frame. And today's video is gonna be sponsored by Simply Safe, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Let's go ahead and just jump right into topic number one, which is gonna be zoning. Now, when talking about zoning, what, what matters with zoning is that even though you own the property or, you know, I assume you own the property that you're wanting to build on, that doesn't mean that you can build on it. You're going to need to check with any local zoning official to confirm that you can, in fact, build. And also what they're going to probably give you is maybe a requirement on the size limit to what you can build. A lot of times that's based off of, you know, maybe your your size of your house, the size of your lot or your property, those things can come into play. And also they're gonna probably give you information about setbacks. That is how far off of the property line you need to be in order to build. Um, the other thing that you might need to consider is if you're in an HOA or there is some sort of an HOA where you're building, you sometimes have to build to a certain spec. They might require a brick facade on the front. They might not allow you to have a metal siding. So there's all these sorts of rules that you're gonna to need to look up and I can't tell you exactly your process, but what I would recommend first is wherever your building department is for your specific area, go talk to them, see if there's some path you need to follow and they're gonna lead you to permits, they're gonna lead you to any fees, any variance you need to apply for. If you have to go to a, you know, a zoning meeting and, and talk to them, there's gonna be a process to build. Luckily for me here where I built my shop that we're in right now, you know, all I had to do was go to the county office, apply for a permit, give them a, an example of what I was gonna be building. So like a floor plan layout, kind of a rough sketch of where on my property it was gonna go. They wanted to check and make sure I could do that, which I could. They gave me a setback, I think of 20 feet. So I had to stay off my property lines, 20 feet, but I didn't have height restrictions. I didn't have size restrictions. Um, I didn't have to worry about things like water runoff. So all of these things are gonna to come to you through that department. And that's where you're gonna to wanna to check first. All right, the second thing we're gonna talk about is location, and I'm referring to the location on your property. This is very important because you wanna be able to access your building appropriately. So if it's gonna be a pool house, obviously you're gonna to wanna to put this thing close to your pool. If it's gonna be a motorhome storage building, you're gonna want it accessible from the road or a driveway. You're not gonna want it at the top of a steep hill, and you're definitely gonna not want it in a position that you can't actually, you know, back in or park the motorhome in there. So location seems to be trivial, but you know, you want to think through the possible uses of it and you don't want to limit yourself by sticking it in a location that you, you know, will regret in the future. Now, the other thing that you want to think about is, uh, let's say water drainage. You know, there's going to be a big roof on this thing. Potentially you're going to have water coming off of it. How are you going to mitigate that water, get it off your property? You don't want to build in an area that is low and water is going to be flowing through it. So, you know, those are things that you're going to want to consider. However, you can always bring in, and I would recommend a professional to give you a nice level pad, talk to you about those options, because if they're a professional, they do this all the time. They're going to have really good insight into your specific situation versus me just talking to you about it. Location is important because you don't want to do this and realize you made a huge mistake. On to number three. Three is going to be size. We're going to want to think about the size of our building because size matters. Bigger is not always better, but in this case, I'm going to recommend you to look at what you want to use the building for. You know, put a bunch of like scaled items inside of a box, figure out what you are going to need for space, and then go a little bit bigger if you can. Obviously, there are going to be size restrictions for some people, but if you can, go a little bit bigger but don't go too big. And what I mean by that is I built a, a structure for a customer a while back. He was gonna be storing golf carts and he wanted a huge building. He was like, let's just go bigger by eight feet and go to the next size up because typically eight foot post spacings, it just made sense to go eight more feet. But what he was doing, it wasn't actually gonna gain him anything. The way the racks were gonna be stored inside, the way he was gonna load and unload these golf carts off of the racks, Eight more feet just meant eight more feet of space, not eight more usable feet of storage. So think about what you're gonna use it for. Think about any potential future use and just go a little bit bigger if you can so that you're not you know, just doing the bare minimum and then regretting it later. I've never had a client tell me, Kyle, we built this too big. It's literally always been, and I would say nine out of 10 jobs, the client has said, ah, I wish I would've went a little bit bigger and don't we all. All right, on to number four, which is the use of the building. And what I guess is important, and it seems pretty trivial, you, you're putting up a building for a reason, so you probably know the use, 
but I think it's important to consider, you know, at this point, okay, if I'm gonna be using it for strictly storage, then you probably don't need all the bells and whistles. You probably don't need a super expensive foundation wall. Maybe you don't need insulation in the walls. Um, so think about the use of the building, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this because I think this is pretty trivial. I think it's something that most people can understand, uh, but it's important because when you talk to your builder, explaining to them how you're gonna use it, at least if you're talking to me, how you're gonna use it will depend on how I build it, okay? So if you're not honest with me of how you're gonna use it, then you might not get as good of a job um, as you would want for what your use is. And let me explain. I don't mean like my quality is gonna suck. I'm saying that like specifically, if you tell me, Kyle, I just want a shell of a building. We're never gonna use it for anything else. And then in the back, you know that you're gonna come in with your buddies and you're gonna insulate it, you're gonna heat it, you're gonna turn it into a little you know, man cave or whatever. You missed out because I would have built it differently so that you could do that because there's different levels of post frame and while Yes, it would be nice to just always get the top tier. We frame our windows differently if it's not gonna be insulated. We don't do an interior grade board detail with a rat board so that your interior is protected because you told me you weren't gonna insulate, you weren't gonna put concrete. Like, so it matters, just be open and honest, have a, have a plan on what the use is so that your builder can understand the end goal and give you what you need to have a successful project. All right, on to number five, which is everybody's favorite budget, money. That's always the biggest you know, elephant in the room. People wanna know how much is this gonna cost me? Uh, Cause I don't wanna spend a lot of money, nobody does. So we've decided where we can build, we decided how big we can build, we know what we want. So how do we know exactly what it's gonna cost us? Listen, there's no secret formula. If you talk to somebody and they say it's gonna be X amount of dollars per square foot to build your building, Dude, they did not take any time to figure that out. They're just throwing a number out. Maybe it's based off of past projects and it's close, but it's not an accurate number and you cannot accept a bid from somebody that's based on square foot, okay? I like to use square foot pricing just as a rule of thumb in my own mind because I've done enough. I know about what a building costs, but everything is individual. Every door changes the price. Every foot in length and width changes the price. Like there's so many factors, obviously, that go into a building that just a straight square foot number does not work. But I will give you guys some rules of thumb. I'll give you some, some ideas so that you at least have an idea what to expect. Okay, if you watch my channel, our buildings, the way we build, which is probably not typical to every builder, uh, you might be starting at like the 15 to $20 a square foot and going all the way up to 150 bucks a square foot you know, for like a house or something. Somewhere in the middle, you're gonna get a really dang nice shed, a nice man cave, something that you can really, really be proud of on your property. Uh, and I like to say that even down at the bottom, $20, 15 bucks, we could put up a heck of a nice storage building, okay? So obviously those prices are gonna be drastically different depending on what you're doing. I think that using that kind of scale, if you're looking for basic, it's gonna be here. If you want mid-range, it's gonna be here. And if you're going high-end residence, it's gonna be up here, and guess what? It could be even higher. I can't really tell you that. It's hard to budget, uh, but just know this, and this is what I wanted to talk about when it comes to budget. You are gonna know your finances. You're gonna know what you're willing to spend on the project. You've got your list of things that you want, and you know what it's gonna be used for. You give that to your builder, whoever is gonna be building, and you tell them, this is what I want. This is what I'm willing to pay. Can we do it? If it's yes, then, then move on, build it, be happy. It's what you want, and it's your budget. If it's not, then you need to find out why and what you can do to reduce the cost, to make it fit, but hopefully without sacrificing all the things that are important. Okay, before we move on to number six, we're gonna talk about today's sponsor, which is Simply Safe. Simply Safe is a robust whole home security system that is affordable, easy to use, and free of hidden contracts and fees. If you wanna make your house feel safer, right now Simply Safe is having the best deals of the year where you can save up to 50% or more on a award winning security system. A Simply Safe system is customized to your home with a comprehensive lineup of sensors and cameras that connect 24 7 to a remote monitoring system that can send help fast when you need it. What's even better is that it's shipped directly to your doorstep and can all be controlled and monitored from an app on your phone. They have sensors for windows, rooms and doors and other accessories like temperature sensors, doorbell cameras, carbon monoxide sensors and smart door locks. Simply Safe has also come out with a brand new outdoor camera that has 140 degree field of view, 1080p HD resolution, an 8x zoom with built in spotlight with a color night vision 
so you can monitor around the clock. I know it's easy to rack up costs with other monitoring services, but Simply Safe's professional monitoring service starts at just 50 cents a day. Simply Safe has been awarded and recommended by experts and is trusted by over 3 million Americans. You know, for me, Simply Safe had all the right sensors and cameras that I wanted for my home, and it was super easy and intuitive to set up. I personally like being able to see what's going on around my property when I'm not at home, and I like to check and make sure that nobody's messed with the temperature on the thermostat. So right now, save 50% or more on your Simply Safe security system with their biggest sales of the year. Visit simplysafe.com slash rrbuildings to learn more. All right, thank you Simply Safe for sponsoring this video, and we're back now with number six, which is foundation. Okay, a lot of people ask me why we do a foundation wall on some buildings, why do we do a pier on others, can I just put my post in the ground, or what about like a slab on grade? You know, I see a lot of people just put a slab out there and start building. So here's my insight, and this is my feelings. If you don't care about it lasting maybe your lifetime, or maybe it's only gonna last your lifetime, go ahead and put posts in the ground. It's definitely not the best way to do it, but hey, they've been doing it, and I've even done it over the years. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tried and true system, but there are guarantees. It will rot, and it will decay, probably blow over, and you'll have to rebuild it guaranteed, right? Maybe not you, but your kids or your kids' kids, right? If you want uh, the best, I would say put a foundation wall. And the reason I say that is because I'm in Northern Illinois, we have frost to deal with, and a footing wall is gonna go below the frost line and ensure that your building is never going to move or you know, get damaged from the frost heave that can occur in the Northern regions. Now the problem is a full footing wall does cost a lot more money. You gotta excavate and pour an entire perimeter wall around your structure. Now, if you're looking at cost, it used to be 45 bucks a foot could do like a four foot wall around your building. Uh, obviously, if you do some of this yourself, maybe get like an insulated uh, concrete form, like an ICF, you can do this a lot cheaper. You can do it yourself, but that's kind of the cost that is associated with a foundation wall. And uh, it's gonna get you the best job because critters won't be able to dig underneath. You won't have to worry about frost. If you're gonna be heating and cooling the interior, it gives you a better barrier against the elements on the outside because you can insulate that wall. So there's a lot of benefits to the foundation wall, but the biggest to me being that there will never be wood anywhere near the ground. Now you take the concrete pier concept that we do a lot of uh, and is, is taking on a lot more people are doing it. I think is a great middle ground because you're getting the post out of the ground. Yes, you still have a grade board that is you know, up against the potential outdoors, dirt and gravel, whatever you're gonna put up against the building. That will have to be replaced at some point. The grade board will not last forever. That's inevitable, but it's an easy thing to replace. You remove some you know, exterior steel, which is why we like to do a wainscoat and replace the board, put it back on and you're about your way. It's not the end of the world and you might have to do it once once per generation, right? The, otherwise, the building should stand for a long time. Now, for me, I don't like a, uh, a floating slab. I don't like to build on a slab because with post frame, all of the weight is bearing on those posts, which means those posts are gonna be sitting on that slab, potentially causing a problem, and you might have slab breakup or you know um, weight issues in a certain area, right? Because it's all being directed onto those post areas. So maybe if you're not in a colder climate and you don't have to worry about frost, you could get away with pouring an integrated slab and pier like system. So dig your holes and pour it all at once so it's continuous and you might not have that issue and you would get that bearing you know, point on each of those piers. But in the Northern regions, it's not really a good idea and I wouldn't recommend it. So hopefully that answers some of the questions about foundations. And when you talk to your builder, knowing what the use of your building is, um, will kind of dictate maybe what foundation system you use. One thing I will say is that if you're on somewhat of a sloped property, a foundation wall is definitely the good way to go because it's gonna be the best against that slope and you know long-term um, erosion potential along that building. So a foundation wall, in my opinion, is up here. We've got the pier in the middle and we've got posts in the ground way at the bottom. All right, I think we're on number seven here and it's gonna be windows and doors. And what I wanna talk about with windows and doors, first, let's talk about windows. People are inherently cheap. They don't like to spend a lot of money. So they're like, ah, I don't need any windows. You know, I don't want windows. It's just too much more money and I don't want to spend the money. Listen, what you're spending on the building, a couple windows 
is not gonna break the bank and it's gonna add a ton of value. Maybe you're gonna turn around and sell this in a few years. Windows are gonna add curb appeal. They're aesthetic, they look great. On the inside, you walk in, you get a little bit of free light, can kind of get in, see what you're doing. Maybe you're just gonna jump in your vehicle and leave. Maybe you don't want people seeing directly into your building, so you say, I don't want any windows. We like to throw our windows up high, underneath the eave. It adds a ton of free light, and I think it's a very nice aesthetic when the sun is rising and that light is shining through that window, kind of illuminating the space. It does a lot better job of lighting up your space than a window down low does. Um, and I think they just look really good, so it's something to consider. You don't see them a lot but if you don't wanna put windows for security risk, go ahead and run them up high by your eave, and I think it's a good option if you want some natural light. Now on the doors. Walk doors are something that, you know, I think minimally you should put all 36 inch walk doors in. Now listen, do not let your builder talk you into a wood framed cheap door on your building. The door is the thing that you are going to be going in and out all the time get a steel frame door, not like a stick frame home. A steel frame door is gonna hold up a lot better through the time and the elements and the use than a wood frame door will, especially if you're not doing like a fully insulated concrete slab or something. I can't tell you how many times I've seen garbage wood frame doors put into post frames to save money and they don't last. So get yourself a good steel door, it's gonna hold up better, and it's just gonna work better throughout the life of the building. Now, let's talk about overhead doors. Most likely you're building this structure to store something, toys, RV, cars, overhead doors are important. I do not like sliding doors personally, that's just a personal thing. When a client comes to me with a sliding door, I try to talk them out of it. Typically it's because they wanna save money. You're gonna spend a little bit more up front on an overhead door. If you don't need to insulate it, and that's why you're doing a sliding door, you know, get a non-insulated overhead door. I say just get an overhead door, push a button, and have it open up. Over time, you won't have to service that door nearly as often as a sliding door. They inherently just, they start to sag over time, they have issues, they rub, and they're hard to open and close uh, throughout the life of the building. So I don't like roller doors. I just go ahead and put in an overhead door. Uh, things to consider when I'm building, because steel is in three foot increments, I always try to get my door in some form of a three foot you know, panel size. So nine foot wide if they want a single door, we try to go 18 wide if they wanna be able to pull two vehicles in and so on and so forth. Um, height wise, I try not to do anything less than eight foot tall just because that'll allow you to get any large vehicle in. If you're gonna be bringing trailers, RVs, motorhomes, you really should consider going up to a 14 foot tall door because that, that ensures that you will be able to get any motorhome that goes down the road most likely through your door. One thing to consider is that if you're gonna be selling, doors are a big selling point. So if it is a big shed, but you go ahead and just you know put small doors on it, it's really gonna limit the person that says, man, I really wish that big shed had a big door so I could park my motor home in it. Like that would be a good thing. It's not a whole lot more money to go taller with a door um, if you've already got the, the wall height you know, built into the building. So just things to consider. I like, once again, this is where bigger is better. If you can fit a bigger door, great. Don't use the mentality that every time you open it, you're gonna have heat loss. It's not a big deal. You're really not gonna lose much. And it's not like you're going in and out of it every 10 minutes. All right, number eight is gonna be talking about insulation. And obviously this will, you know, this will be determined based on whether or not you're gonna heat and cool the space. Is it gonna be something that you need insulation will change whether you care about this or not. So what I like to say is, and I've done videos on this, and I know I've changed my tune a little bit, but that's really only because of the type of project we've been doing, not because I believe uh, differently than I used to, okay? And what I mean by that is post frame buildings are inherently efficient, or they're set up for efficiencies because of their large, wide open bays, their large space, it can be insulated very easily, and you don't have all these you know, openings to the world, like a ton of windows, a ton of doors. You don't have uh, studs every 16 inches creating thermal breaks. It's very easy to be efficient. So if you're just gonna do a simple storage heated building, maybe a good R19 bat in the wall is what we would typically use. And it's a cost effective way to get an efficiently heated or conditioned space. You need to make sure that your builder details the wall cavity so you don't have air moving through the wall. I've heard people say that their builder told them that the steel was gonna stop all the wind and moisture from coming into your building because it's a good vapor barrier. And it just blows my mind because uh, wind will go right through all those gaps in the metal. There is not a perfect seal anywhere on a metal skinned wall. So we house wrap all of our buildings, okay? Even if we're not going to insulate them, the customer might down the road. It's just 
good practice to go ahead and run the house wrap. It's a small cost, but it reaps big reward later on down the road. Because if you can stop the air movement in a post frame, you have this huge cavity of insulation, it's gonna be very efficient. Now, when we move into the higher end buildings, places that maybe uh, you're gonna be building a home in or whatever, I do like spray foam because it's a complete air seal. We can be a little bit sloppier as a builder, which we try not to be, but it's gonna air seal that wall cavity. You don't want air moving around in that wall because that's when you have issues down the road. The whole, the old saying of, you know, let a house breathe, that's not really true. Um, and that's a whole nother video and I'm not the best building science expert to talk about it. If you wanna be on the, the value side and still get good R value, get good efficiencies, you house wrap your exterior well, detail it well, make sure it's air sealed. And then you can just use a fiberglass blanket in that wall cavity. You can blow it in after the walls are up. Or if you wanna spend a little bit more money for a even better you know, job well done, go ahead and use spray foam. We use closed cell spray foam because once you've done two inches of closed cell, you also get your vapor barrier. So we don't have to worry about moisture passing through the insulation and that warm moist air condensating on the back of our metal. Now let's real quick talk about the heating options for a post frame because people always ask me, how do you heat your shops? And we're gonna start at the top. A radiant heated floor is awesome. Working on a heated floor is amazing. It feels good. It heats the objects and the room very well. And when you open a big door uh, and the cold air rushes in, it doesn't take a long time to, to recoup that heat because the objects themselves are up to temperature versus when you're blowing air around and it's a forced air system, you have to reheat the air and the object. So hopefully that makes sense. A radiant system is definitely way better than a forced air system, but it is a lot more costly. You gotta put your pipes in the ground, you got a boiler, you've got thermostats, you've got pumps, you know, all this stuff can really add up, but it is awesome. However, let's say you want that same effect as a radiant system, but you don't wanna spend all that money. That's what I wanted, and that is why I did a radiant tube heater. So it's a tube that runs across the ceiling, it radiates heat, and it also heats the objects in the room versus the air. So I don't have air blowing around creating dust all over my stuff. It's really good in a shop specifically for the dust factor, but it does a really good job of heating all the objects in here. So the more stuff I have in my shop, the more efficient my radiant heater system is. But I will say, no matter what system you use, it's gonna be very efficient in a post frame if done correctly, just due to the sheer nature of how a post frame is built. All right, we're close to the end here, guys. We're on number nine. Thank you for sticking along with me. If this has been helpful to you, make sure you guys hit that thumbs up. And if you haven't already, and you wanna to continue to see more content, hit that subscribe button. It's greatly appreciated. But for number nine, we're gonna go ahead and talk about electrical, plumbing, and the mechanicals. Okay, so you've got this nice shed, and maybe you're gonna want a bathroom in it. Maybe you're gonna to wanna to make sure you got lights in it, which I would recommend. Um, you know, maybe you're gonna have welder, all that stuff. You wanna think about what the building, once again, this goes back to the use side of it. What are you gonna use it for and what kind of mechanicals are you gonna need? I recommend building the main structure, then bringing in somebody to bring in your water lines, your drains, um, your electrical lines, all that good stuff. Don't do it beforehand. Personally, as a builder, I don't want all that in my way. And I think it gives everybody a better understanding of exactly where things need to go when they have a physical thing to measure off of. If you're gonna be doing a bathroom, all that underground stuff needs to be done. You're gonna to need to talk to probably your county zoning about permits for septic tanks, what you need if you're gonna want floor drains and oil water separators. But there's a lot of things to consider when you start putting plumbing in the ground, when you start running your electrical, how big of a service are you gonna be able to put in? You're gonna to need to talk to your local power company to determine if they can get you new service, if you need to just split off of your home, if you need a 100 amp box, a 200 amp box, like those things I can't tell you, that's all gonna be based on what you're using, but it's things to consider when you you know start this build process so that you have all your T's crossed and your I's dotted. All right, guys, we made it to the end, and the final thing we're gonna talk about is the builder, the person that's gonna be doing the work. Now, hopefully a lot of you guys out there, maybe you're handy, maybe you've watched a lot of my videos, you feel good about building it yourself, and I applaud you. I think that's awesome. I think it's a great experience. It's a great rewarding time when you have a pile of material and then you build something and you can step back and say, I built that. But now that everybody can do that, I understand not all of us have the time. Heck, I would like to build myself a house and I don't have time, right? So I understand that. Uh, if you're looking for a builder, people always ask me, you know, how can I find somebody that cares about quality? How can I find somebody that's gonna build the way you do? And I can't really answer that because I don't know 
all the builders across the country that build similar to us, that care about what they do. But what I would recommend is, first off, we've gone through the first nine things. At this point, you should be a very well um, educated client. You should know what you want. You have all this information and you present it to prospective builders and say, this is what I want. Can you do this? Show me examples of your work that is similar to this. Let me go and talk to some of those past clients of yours. I wanna see the work. And once you've done that, once you're comfortable, listen, you have to trust them. That's part of the process and there's nothing you can do about it. The goal though, obviously, is to find somebody hopefully that you know, that one of your friends knows, that, that has worked on one of your friend's projects and they were happy with, and then you can feel a lot better about it. If you want to ensure that they uh, maybe build to a certain standard or a certain style, I do have plans available, so I'm gonna plug my plan site here. I would greatly appreciate the support. Maybe you want to uh, check out the more in-depth design. Uh, I will put a link down below to the plan page and you can you can purchase those, you can use the design even if the building is not exactly what you want. My designer's information is also attached to the plan and you can contact them, they can modify the plan. The big thing being that the plans were put together to help people build structures in the same design and manner that we build. So the way the trusses are connected, the way the purlins are connected, the way we use the post brackets, those details are all spelled out. And I did that to hopefully, well, I'll be honest, I'm selfish. I, I was trying to mitigate the amount of time I was spending talking to people because it gets overwhelming. So I thought, let's make the plans available and, uh, and hopefully that will help people give them the information that they need to build to a higher standard. You can get those, you can bring them to your builder and I highly recommend, and this isn't just so you buy my plan, but I highly recommend you don't go to your builder until you have a set of plans. Even if it's a simple napkin drawing, you need to show them what you want because don't leave it up to them and their imagination to assume what you want, and then when you don't get it, you're upset. That is on you. You need to have all this information that we've talked about today, a nice plan, maybe some inspiration pictures, all of that prepared, and say, boom, this is what I want. There's nothing more frustrating as a builder than getting a message from somebody saying, how much for a 32 by 48? Oh, I don't know. Like, that's ridiculous, dude. You can't ask me that, and I'm not gonna give you any answer. Come with as much information as you can, do your homework on looking at the builder, stalk them a little bit, go on the social media, maybe they've got pictures of their work, maybe you can see what kind of person they are. We're in a world where you can do that now and it's actually legal, so it's kind of nice. I hope that these things helped you guys. I genuinely have been going back and forth about doing this video, I've been asked to do it so many times. I feel like it's boring as heck. I'm sitting here talking to you guys, but you know what, for the maybe the 10 people it will help, or 20 people, or even the one person. If one person says, dude, this video was so valuable to me, I'm in this exact position and I needed this information, then you know what, it's great. But with that being said, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here. If there's a video that you would like to see in the future, also let me know what that might be and I'll do my best to incorporate it. But for now, I'm gonna get out of here. You guys have a good one and we'll catch you on the next video.